Istenem, jöjj segítségemre! Uram, Dicsőség az Atyának, a Fiúnak, és a Szent Léleknek. Miképpen kezdetben, most és mindörökké. Hogy szíklak én? 
áldott legyen az Isten, Urunk Jézus Krisztus Atya, az Írgalom Atya és a minden vigasztalás Istene. Ő megvigasztal minket minden szomorúságunkban, hogy mi is megvigasztalhassuk azokat, akik szomorúak, azt a vigasztalást nyújtva nekik, amelyet ő nyújt nekünk. Amilyen bőven kiút nekünk Krisztus szenvedéseiből, olyan bőven lesz részünk Krisztus révén a vigasztalásban is. Kedves testvérek, béke veletek! Béke legyen veletek mindenkor, különösen ma, amikor a Nemzetközi Eukarisztikus Kongresszus tematikus napjai sorában elérkeztünk a békesség napjához. Ez az egyik legfontosabb örökségünk, amelyet Urunk Jézus Krisztustól kaptunk, aki halála előtt így végrendelkezett, békességet hagyok rátok, az én békémet adom nektek. Honnan volt az ő békéje? Onnan, hogy egész életében az atya akaratát kereste, neki akart kedvében járni. Ennek az akaratnak a teljesítése volt a benne lakozó végtelen béke záloga amelyet mindig az atya közelében talált meg. Amikor 12 évesen a templomban tanított, amikor nagy döntései előtt imádkozott, és akkor is, amikor földi élete végét látta közeledni, vagy a kereszten szenvedett. Az öröm és a jóság napja után ma mi is az atya közelségében keressük a békességet. Azért imádkozunk, hogy töltsön el vele bennünket és az egész világot. Amikor béke van, akkor nyugodt a lelkünk, akkor életünk folyása egyenletes, terveinket meg tudjuk valósítani, harmóniában élhetünk, fejlődés, szolidaritás, társadalmi kohézió, felelősség, vállalás jellemzi tágabb környezetünket is. Szívünk békéje kihat tehát a közösség a társadalom lelki állapotára. Ha ott van sok ember szívében, akkor könnyebben uralkodik a népek között is a bizalom és az együttműködés. Békében a gyengéket felkarolják, a rászorulókat támogatják, a békétlenség, a vetélkedés és az acsarkodás viszont nem csak egyes népek életét teheti pokollá, hanem személyes kapcsolatainkat is mérgezi. Amikor Krisztus békéjéről elmélkedünk, akkor nem csak a fegyverek hallgatására, vagy egy kényes katonai egyensúly fenntartására gondolunk. Ez a béke sokkal többet jelent a háború hiányánál. Nem úgy adom nektek, ahogy a világ adja. Ez a szív mélyén kezdődik, és onnan árad kifelé, szolgálva a személy, a társadalom, az egész emberiség békéjét. Mindannyiunk legnemesebb törekvése békében lenni önmagunkkal, családunkkal, azokkal, akik között élünk, és békében lenni magával Istennel. Hogyan tehetünk szert erre a békére? Hogyan tudjuk Jézus örökségét birtokba venni? Hogyan segít ebben bennünket a Nemzetközi Eukarisztikus Kongresszus? Ráirányítja figyelmünket a szentáldozás, 
a szentségimádás, az imádság és a jó cselekedetek fontosságára. Mindegyik hatékonyan segít bennünket egyéni békevágyunk és az emberiség békéjének megvalósításában. Kérjük az Urat ma reggel, hogy már most árassza el lelkünket az ő békéje, hogyha bármi zavaró dolog történik velünk a nap során, azt az ő békéjének pajzsával fogadjuk, hogy Krisztus békéje, amely a szentáldozáskor a szívünkbe költözik, erősebb legyen ösztönös természetünknél. A napi szentáldozás tartja életben, táplálja a bennünk lakó új embert. Ezért nélkülözhetetlen, hogy rendszeresen magunkhoz vegyük, belőle éljünk. Segítenek ebben a Szent Mise békéről szóló imádságai is, amelyek a szentáldozásra készítenek fel, és arra emlékeztetnek, hogy nem lehetünk méltók a Szentest vételére, ha nem élünk békességben és szeretetben egymással. Dinamikus kapcsolat van imádságaink és a szentség hatékony ereje között. Az imádság erősíti vágyunkat, a szentség pedig hatékonyan munkálja bennünk a békét. Azért vesszük tiszta lélekkel magunkhoz az eukarisztiát, azért köszöntjük egymást a békejelével, hogy a feltámadt Krisztus békéje töltsön el bennünket. A békesség napja van, bár csak ma egyáltalán ne nyugodna le a nap, és a béke örökké tartana. Imádkozzunk érte, együtt Assisi Szent Ferenccel, Kalkuttai Szent Teréz anyával, a mai nap szentjeivel, a kassai vértanukkal, Szent Márk, István és Menyhért, áldozó papokkal és vértanukkal, és mindazokkal, akiknek szívében ég a béke vágya. Tégy engem, Uram, a Te békéd eszközévé. Amen.
testvéreim, az Isten igéje miatt megölt vértanukban, ünnepeljük üdvözítőnket a hűséges tanút, és énekeljük. Vértanúid által, akik a hit bizonyságául önként vállalták a halált, add meg nekünk, Urunk, a lélek igazi szabadságát. Vértanúid által, akik vérük ontásával megvallották hitüket, add meg nekünk, Urunk, a tiszta és álhatatos hitet. Vértanúid által, akik keresztjüket felvéve nyomodban jártak, Add meg nekünk, Urunk, hogy erős lélekkel viseljük az élet megpróbáltatásait. Vértanúid által, akik megmosták ruhájukat a bárány vérében, Add meg nekünk, Urunk, hogy legyőzzük a test és a világ minden csábítását. Preceptis salutaribus moniti. Et divina institutione formati, audemus dicere. Urunk Istenünk, segíts meg minket, Szent Márk, István és Menyhért, Kassai vértanúk közben járó imájára, hogy akiknek győzelmét örvendezve ünnepeljük, azoknak álhatatos hitét is kövessük, ami Urunk Jézus Krisztus a Te fiad által, aki veled él és uralkodik a szent lélekkel egységben, Isten mindörökkön örökké. Amen. És a Áldjon meg benneteket a mindenható Isten, az Atya, a Fiú és
és a Szent Lélek. Amen. Menjetek békével. Istennek legyen Egy-kettő, most már jó. Kedves vendégeink, mielőtt bejelenteném a következő előadót, találtunk egy mobiltelefont, amelynek tulajdonosa Nisetas V. Belarmino Aleta Hill. Hogyha esetleg hallja most ezt a, azt az üzenetet, akkor az információs pulthoz fáradjon, és ott át tudja venni a mobiltelefonját. Ladies and gentlemen, we found a mobile phone, which owner is Nisetas V. Belarmino Aleta Hill. If you hear this, please go to the information checkpoint. Thank you. Kedves résztvevők, most pedig egy vidám bíboros katekézise következik. Kevesen merjük kimondani, vidám és boldog vagyok. Gerard Lacroix bíboros, kebekérseke viszont közéjük tartozik. Egykor grafikusként dolgozott, majd csatlakozott egy misszionáriushoz és Kolumbiába ment. Ott szólított meg az Úr, hogy kövessem, mesélte később. 
Nem akart pap lenni, végül az lett, és kilenc éven át szolgálta a gerillák által ellenőrző tövezetben Kolumbiában, ahol összvérháton közlekedett a hegyes vidéken fekvő, más módon meg sem közelíthető plébániái között. Gérard Lacroa egy vidám bíboros. Ennek forrása vallja, hogy szeretjük Istent. Fogadják őt nagyon sok szeretettel és olyan vidáman, amilyen vidám ő maga. Jó napot! Bonjour! Good morning! Buenos dias! Ja, yeah, no más. Dear brothers and sisters, please allow me to express my joy to be with you today sharing this beautiful moment of meditation and prayer of reflection. What a blessing to finally be here in Budapest after this long-awaited Eucharistic, International Eucharistic Congress. Special thanks to Cardinal Erdu, his colleagues, and the wonderful team of people who prepared this, all the volunteers who are making this event such a special moment for all of us. Thank you so much. We are gathered to deepen our faith in Jesus and to savor the grace He bestows upon us as He lives with us in the Eucharist. It is Jesus Himself who is the one and true subject of the Eucharist. It is appropriate to say what, who, who is the Eucharist rather than what is the Eucharist, and then reflect on its power to act as an educator and the source of peace and reconciliation in our lives and in our world. So I suggest we place Jesus at the center of our meditation and to designate Him as Christ the Eucharist. In this view, we are able to designate ourselves our brothers and sisters in Him, as St. Paul himself teaches to the Galatians. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave or free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When speaking of the Eucharist, we often refer to the grace it bestows as a source because it is like water that springs from the depths of the earth that quenches that quenches the thirst and it is pure and free what a beautiful image of that of a source to designate the benefits provided by the eucharist jesus offers his own body and blood and food that gives life because it springs from the depths of his own divine heart and from the infinite and merciful love of God our Father. The Eucharist is an inexhaustible, endless, and everlasting, and it is offered free of charge to anyone who hungers and thirsts for peace. 
By nature, the Eucharist is the sacrament of peace. Such is a fundamental truth recalled to us by Pope Benedict XVI. The encounter with Christ in the Eucharist is a source of peace since it enables us to learn to experience the Eucharist as a great school of peace. Our communion with Christ in His Word, in the Eucharistic bread, enlivens the love needed to heal the breaches with our brothers and sisters. It also triggers the energy to undertake the mission and to build a world of peace. It is particularly interesting to point out what most of you already know, of course, that the city of Budapest, where we are now gathered for this Eucharistic Congress, is probably one of the only capitals in the world where caves are hidden under its streets and dug mainly by springs. Let us therefore pray that all the paths of our own lives may be built on the sources of living waters. All my springs are in you, as proclaim the psalmists, that fertilize them with meaning, grace, peace, and reconciliation. May we leave Budapest at the end of this unique experience abundantly renewed, energized, and eager to bring to the world the joy of knowing that peace is possible, that it is offered to every person of goodwill, and that we witness its implementation in any effort of reconciliation within our reach. In other words, if a Christian sees the Eucharist as merely a sight to behold rather than a call to be lived out, the fruits of Christ's Paschal mystery will not reach the larger global community. The precious peace that Jesus offers is to be shared generously. And so I say to you, as we already heard this morning, peace be with you. These are the very words of Jesus after His resurrection. They are now pronounced by the bishop at the beginning of every Mass. I suggest we take a moment to recall the context in which they were first pronounced and consider the effect they produced on the apostles and the disciples and how this greeting is challenging for us now. Barely emerging from the confinement of His tomb, Jesus joins His disciples who are locked behind closed doors of a secret place in a greeting uttered with great sweetness, sensing the emotion that His sudden appearance may cause. Jesus gently offers them His peace. His voice is well recognizable and it frees the disciples from their gloom and inertia. It revives the joyful enthusiasm of the Master's call. As on the day when hearing Him announce the arrival of a new era, they left everything to follow Him. On the new day following His resurrection, the doors of His kingdom are unlocked. Jesus presents Himself in His glorified body and shows them the wounds of His hands and His side to prove that He is neither a ghost nor the effect of an illusion. The experience of touching Him to be sure they are witnessing without any confusion a real body of flesh is offered to Thomas. His disbelief passes through this requirement. Jesus generously accepts his requests since it leads to Thomas's expression of faith. 
the fact is, the fact is of utmost importance for us when we receive the Eucharist, the living body of Christ. Fear has caused the apostles to lock themselves in the face of threats of outside political and religious powers. When the peace of the risen one crosses the wall of this fear, it spreads a favorable climate of security. Peace invades the abyss had caused by the disappearance of the Master and fills the hearts of the disciples with the joy of being comforted with His living presence. Peace also revives the memory of all the words of love, compassion, mercy, healing that Jesus showed in them and in the lives of countless peoples they encountered as they walked together through towns and cities. The peace of the Lord ignites the disciples with the fire of the Holy Spirit to go out and spread the warmth of grace throughout the world. They have seen the Lord with their own eyes. They have heard His voice. They have even touched and eaten with Him. And their faith is now stronger. St. John affirms in his first letter, what we have seen and heard we proclaim now to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. For our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. A short glance at the life of Jesus allows us to comprehend how much He understood the deep expectations and needs of all human beings. Throughout His life, Jesus touched, listened, consoled, nurtured, nurtured friendships, and admired the beauties of nature. He mourned grief and betrayal. He understood how gestures expressing affection, proximity, and fidelity were essential to us men and women who experience all realities through our senses and our intellectual and emotional faculties. How can we be surprised then that He would choose sensitive signs to so close to what we love in life, namely bread and wine, shared in the fraternity of brothers and sisters around a meal to manifest His presence forever in the Eucharist? The church gratefully attests to this grace, to this gift, which seals a new covenant as expressed so beautifully in the fourth Eucharistic prayer. To accomplish your plan, He gave Himself up to death, and rising from the dead, He destroyed death and restored life. It may seem utopian, even candid, to speak of peace and reconciliation at a time when we are witnessing the breakup of societies and communities that have until now defined themselves as inseparable. For a long time they were regarded as unwavering models of union, union and cohesion. Even a brief look at our planet and the world around us risks making us doubt the possibility of achieving such a high goal. My brothers and sisters, how is peace possible in our world torn by countless upheavals? I don't have to extrapolate very long to convince you that the situation in the world is anything but simple. On many fronts we see the struggles, injustice, forced displacements, 
refugees, corruption, and war. I don't wish to blacken the world situation to demonstrate that peace and reconciliation may seem utopian, but I love to note that beyond all doubts, there are many, many who strive to achieve peace and reconciliation. And I hope that you are all part of those many who believe it is possible with the strength we receive from Christ to build a world of peace. They are pursuing an aspiration deeply inscribed in the human heart and mind. One of the many contemporary prophets who believe that this endeavor is possible was Martin Luther King Jr., who paid with his life for his dream of racial equality and the respect of rights for all people of his country. His famous speech, the main theme, which is summed up in the phrase, I have a dream, calls for the establishment of universal justice and equality among all citizens in a society scandalously divided by apartheid. The kind of peace offered by the Eucharist isn't simply an absence of conflict, but rather an active process, one that works towards the reconciliation and healing of persons, families, and communities. It allows us to believe that aspiring to peace is not as absurd as it seems. The cries of such beacons as Martin Luther King, Madeleine Delbrel, and so many others were reverberated by an eminent prophet of our time, St. Pope Paul VI, who at the Assembly of Representatives of the Nations of the World, the United Nations said, humanity will have to put an end to the war or it is the war that will put an end to humanity. Never again war, never again war. It is not because we have not listened up to it today that we cannot decide to continue taking another route, the route of reconciliation and peace. By the resurrection of Christ, which testifies to the fulfillment of the promise of salvation, and by the outpouring of the Spirit of Pentecost, our Lord is therefore the living stone rejected by men, but chosen and precious before God. The inspiration that animates the lives of Christians of all times comes directly from the person of Jesus Christ. The spiritual structure of which we are living stones is based on the formal promise that He is with us forever, every day until the end of the world. A better world in which peace and reconciliation of all the differences that divide individuals and nations among themselves is no utopia. Christ has made the dream come true by continuing His mission of salvation in the Eucharist, the sacrament of peace and reconciliation. This sacrament of peace bestows God's peace to the church, which in turn commissions all Christians to embody His peace in works of mercy and initiatives of justice. Through this, we see the social and missional implications for a community centered on the Eucharistic table. I often begin my homilies, my letters, and my remarks by the wonderful greeting in the words of the risen Jesus, peace be with you. These words are not reserved only for bishops, but available for all to share. 
these words remind us that our mission is not only to pray for peace, but also to be active instruments of peace. The Eucharist is a source of peace which engages us on that path. Each time I preside the Eucharist, I admire the many ways we participate, at moments in a very personal manner, in silent prayer, and at other moments in a very expressive way, in song, responses, dialogue, and also, I'm sure you have noticed, with gestures with our bodies. Have you noticed how our hands are particularly active in the celebration of the Eucharist? We begin tracing the sign of the cross on ourselves with one hand. Would you do that with me, please? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Then during the penitential rite, we do not hesitate to implore the Lord's mercy, striking our breaths with our hand, with our hands recognizing publicly that we are sinners. Would you put your hand on your breast, please? I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, we do this publicly. And this is not an act of self-pity. No. We are telling the Lord, Lord, I know I am a sinner, but I come to open my heart to you to listen to your word. I need you to be reconciled, to receive your peace. Then as Mass continues, something beautiful happens. The power of the Word of God and the gift of the Eucharist enables us, us to turn to God and recognize Him, not only as our Creator, not only as the eternal and ever-living God, but as our Father. In those same hands, we turn to ourselves. We now turn to God. Will you lift your hands as you all know the Father? And those same hands are now able to say and pray with the brothers and sisters, Our Father who art in heaven. Do you see the pedagogy of the Eucharist slowly opening up our lives and our whole being to God, to Christ, to His plan of salvation? And it's not over yet. There are three more important steps where our hands will be very much needed before the end of Mass. After praying the Our Father and before receiving communion, we are invited to share God's peace with those around us. And that is so important. I would even say essential. Living our faith in communion with God, of course, is the foundation to a healthy Christian life. But learning to live in communion with our brothers and sisters is unavoidable, indispensable, and let's face it, quite a challenge. Participating in the Eucharist is not only to meet the Lord, to be with Him. It is also a school where we learn to love others, to be open to them. Without that, there is no true Christianity. I know some people find it tedious when the priest invites them to share the sign of peace. Brothers and sisters, he says, share the peace of Christ. Oh no, not that again. Why does he just leave me alone? Me alone with God. I'm fine alone. Don't interrupt me with this social distraction. Have you ever heard that? Sometimes we go to give the peace of Christ to someone 
next to us, and he's like this. Or you go to give the peace of Christ, peace be with you. It's okay, but they're missing out on something so beautiful. The peace we receive is a peace to share. And the Eucharist prepares us for that. In fact, let's not forget, in a few moments after this exchanging of the sign of peace, we will be going up the aisle to receive communion, the body of Christ. Those around you are part of His body. We are all part of God's family, brothers and sisters of God's family. The exchange of the sign of peace is a reminder of an opportunity to prepare ourselves to receive Holy Communion, receiving the Lord Jesus, but also to enter into a deeper communion with our brothers and sisters. Jesus in our lives builds communion, unity, community. So in the first insta instance, we open our hands to share the peace of Christ with others, and then we open them again to receive the body and blood of Christ. How precious is that? Very meaningful. Jesus in my hands feeds me. He feeds us, unites us, restores us. Through Him, with Him, and in Him, we encounter peace and reconciliation. Christ not only renews our heart and fills it with peace, but also our capacity to love, to reconcile, and to continue our journey in life as His disciples. And then comes the final blessing and the dismissal, where once again we turn to God to receive His help, His assistance, and the promise of His grace to go forth and live the gospel and bear abundant fruits of reconciliation and peace. We receive God's blessing so we can be a blessing in the midst of the world, immersed in all the realities of life. The liturgy does not simply come to an end. Those assembled are sent forth to bring the fruits of the Eucharist to the world. The bishop, the priest, or the deacon will choose with one of these three phrases, go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Go in peace. Go, glorifying the Lord by your life. And then once again, our hand receives the blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Having nourished us with His presence, the Lord sends us to be instruments of peace. Such is the Eucharist, an inexhaustible source of peace and reconciliation. All my springs are in you. Brothers and sisters, the Eucharist prepares us for the mission we are called to carry out. In Him, Jesus, in the Eucharist, we drink from the sources of life, of abundant life. I was a missionary in Colombia in South America for nine years, a time of many blessings in my life. It was also a moment of profound trials and tribulations in Colombia, a beautiful country with wonderful people, but tortured by an ongoing internal conflict, drug wars, injustice, and a great deal of violence. By the way, if you're distracted by the photo on the right where you see me crossing a river on a horse, if you're asking yourself who is the most scared, the horse or me, it's me.
I was a pastor of a parish in the Andes Mountains composed of 85 small villages, a very remote region of the Archdiocese of Popayan, where violence was omnipresent. They had not had a priest, a pastor, for five years. Many times in the first years of my ministry, I felt overwhelmed by the situation and wondered how I could live in the midst of so much stress and tension. The first year I lived in the midst of this parish as pastor, 35 parishioners were murdered in the main village of 1,700 people. 35 young men. It was quite challenging, to say the least. It was in the celebration of daily Mass that I found the inner peace and strength to continue to serve and love the faithful entrusted to me, praying with the faithful, listening together to the Word of God, receiving Holy Communion, renewed me renewed us every day and gave us the strength and courage to continue with our journey. Without a personal and community relationship with Jesus, I could not have survived and would most probably have run away and given up. I remember many days coming to the Eucharist overwhelmed and powerless, not knowing how to pursue my ministry and coming out of the Eucharist, renewed and filled with the strength that can only come from the Lord. All my springs are in Him, I can say. I have experienced that, and I know it's true. I would not be here today if it were not for daily Eucharist. The presence of the Lord in our midst is what we rely on to live, to witness to the gospel and to the face, the challenges that life presents us. There are many ways of expressing the peace of God as there are a multitude of people who are thirsty to hear this good news resonate in their lives. The Spirit of Jesus doesn't fall on us as in the commotion of a gust of wind. Instead, He chooses to discreetly inhabit our hearts and delicately invites Himself into our world. As we unfold the story of our lives, we can all recognize Him in the many of those moments when he silently played the leading role. Thanks to him, the Holy Spirit, inspiring people have crossed our paths. Serious problems have been solved. Priorities have been reassessed. New avenues have led to more joy and love. Serenity has come to nestle where anxieties were rife. That is the discreet but effective work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The greatest prize of recognition that we could confer upon Christ in the Eucharist for the warmth of His presence and the perseverance of His support is to let Him guide us in all the region where we expect and need His peace in our personal aspects of our lives, up to the peripheries of the environments we know. When He offers His peace to the disciples, Jesus adds, just as the Father sent me, I too send you. We can therefore pronounce words of peace and constantly act with and in His peace. And there are many ways we can proceed. Here are just a few examples, as I am sure you could easily 
find many more. To whoever says that God is silent, by the strength of the Eucharist, I will lend my voice to say words of love to children of victims of abuse, to elderly persons in hospices, to the lonely prisoners that I will visit, to all those who have been injured by abusive and unjust words that I will share words of consolation. To whoever says that God is blind, with the grace of Christ in the Eucharist, I will lend my eyes to highlight the wonders of His creation in the world so that we may all admire His goodness and mutual aid in acts of generosity that people have one for another. To whoever will say, God is deaf, with the wisdom of Christ in the Eucharist, I will lend my ears so that all those I meet hear the voice of tenderness and the promise of the peace and happiness that He offers here on earth and for eternal life. To whoever proclaims the death of God with the conviction given by Christ in the Eucharist, I will attest in all I do His real living presence with those who suffer and the poor to whom He is so close. To whoever says that God is cruel, I will multiply the gestures of tenderness, of listening and, and compassion to reveal that beyond all appearances. In Christ the Eucharist, it is when I am weak that I am strong. To whoever will say that God does not keep His promises, I will remain faithful in all my commitments, both personal and social, to attest that peace and reconciliation in my life are achievable in the imitations of the words of peace of Christ. To those who say that God is absent, by the warmth of Christ in the Eucharist, I will open the doors of my heart and, if possible, my home to refugees fleeing the horrors and the violence of war and the evils of natural disaster. I will cease being prejudiced against racial, social, sexual, and even political differences that poison my life towards all the diversities that the Creator has sown in this world. Brothers and sisters, as you know, the global pandemic has for months deprived countless people and communities of Eucharistic bread and the fraternity of gathering in places of worship. This Eucharistic fasting was felt most harshly by the ones who had never before experienced such a situation and couldn't forecast its length. Sorrowful spirits could have evoked Moses' admonitions to his wandering people. He therefore let you be afflicted with hunger and then fed you with manna, so you might know that it is not by bread alone that people live, but by all that comes forth from the mouth of the Lord. But that wasn't the case in all countries particularly in my Archdiocese of Quebec in Canada, where I can witness of what the pandemic is helping us understand the overwhelming power in the infallible presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes, my brothers and sisters, the Word of God resounds with reassuring force in times of trials. The Spirit of the risen Christ dwells and acts unceasingly with us, through us, and in us. He nourishes us with His grace as He guides our steps, suggests new ways of gathering His people into church. He supports us when we recognize His presence in the poor, the needy, the isolated in which He dwells. Our churches were closed for over four months during the pandemic. 
we could not even celebrate funerals. 200 new small groups like this one you see on the screen began gathering in their homes or when it was not possible through Zoom and Teams and FaceTime every week to share the gospel, celebrating the price, the place, the living presence of Christ in His Word. He enlightens us when He gives us the ability of resourcefulness through the use of various media to convey His Word so it may find a home in the life of the world and so that it nourishes the contemplation, the prayer, and the praise of communities of believers. This is not ideal, celebrating our faith through the internet, but thank God we had that for that moment. It was able to keep us in a certain communion, although distant. Now we start again coming together and appreciating how important it is to be together. When Christians gather by any means whatsoever to proclaim the Word of God and to share the bread of life that feeds them, they never shut the door to the world as they are called to evangelize and serve and love that world. On the contrary, coming to Christ in the Eucharist opens our lives and our communities to a greater community, to a greater commitment, to an active participation in the building of a better world. We acknowledge with pride and gratitude the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to accomplish the miracle of His active presence with the words of St. Paul. I can therefore glorify myself in Christ Jesus with regard to the work of God. We are seeing God at work even in these very difficult times, and for that we must be very grateful. To give us strength and courage on the path of our life, the Lord has left us the sacrament of His Eucharist. Whenever we celebrate our unity in the consecration of bread and wine in memory of Him, we proclaim His death and resurrection until He comes again. Nourished by this divine food and driven by the breath of the Spirit, we are sent towards all our brothers and sisters in all the regions where they are to be found in the deserts of their indifference or their despair, in the oasis of their happiness, their beauty and good deeds, in overcrowded cities and in peaceful villages, wherever lays the heart of a human person in whom Jesus dwells, it is our turn, each and every one of us, to feed those who are hungry for any food that relieves the body and comforts the soul. The Eucharist is not simply reconciliation between God and humanity. It also extends on a horizontal plane as it affects reconciliation between persons with one another. Gathered around the Eucharistic table, the rich and the poor, the young and the elders, the healthy and the sick, the mighty and the weak ones among us, all are nourished and called to be transformed by Christ's body and blood. In the act of gathering around the Eucharistic table, reconciliation takes place. For when we pray to our Father to forgive us our mistakes as we forgive those who have offended us, we proclaim our will to follow Christ on the road towards reconciliation. The sharing of the bread of life engages sharing the very mission of Christ. Since if someone wants to be first, he will be the last and the servant of all. The peace of Christ and His commandment to reconcile with one another are like twin sisters 
who participate in the same thought of the Lord. The Eucharist is not fully fulfilled without reconciliation that ensures the active presence of the peace of the Lord. It is good for us once again to note that John is the only one among the four evangelists not to mention the account of the institution of the Eucharist. Instead, he describes how during this last meal with his disciples, the Lord performed an unusual gesture. He rose from the table, put on an apron, and like a servant began to wash the feet of his disciples. Despite their protests, especially Peter's surprising attitude, Jesus insists and explains the meaning of this gesture. Communion with his body and blood accomplishes in the sharing of the Last Supper implies a total identification with his person and his mission. I have given you a model to follow so that as I have done for you, you should also do. Therefore, Christ is the master and the indisputable model of service, of the total gift of oneself, of charity and mercy towards all. Pope Francis reminds us that the works of love toward neighbor are the most perfect outward manifestations of the inner grace of the Spirit. It is in the face of these values of peace and reconciliation that we can measure the path that we are called to develop so that our participation in the Eucharist may be the peak, the true summit, where we encounter Christ in accordance with His will to be a peaceful and reconciled relationship with others. With our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ and by the grace of the Spirit, we are invited to make sure that the peace of God flourishes abundantly in our life and in the life of the world. I have very good news for you. I come to my closing statement. I find no better words to illustrate our reflection on how the Eucharist is in is an inexhaustible source of peace and reconciliation than those of the late Father Pedro Arupe, who was Superior General of the Society of Jesus and a great champion for peace and justice initiatives. In the Eucharist, we receive not only Christ, the head of the body, but the body's members as well. Wherever there is suffering in the body, wherever members of it are in want or oppressed, we, because we have received the same body, are part of it, must be directly involved. We cannot properly receive the bread of life without sharing bread for life with those in want. To give us strength and courage on the roads of our lives, the Lord has given us the great gift of His Eucharist. Whenever we celebrate our unity in the consecration of the bread and wine in memory of Him, we can then sing hymns such as the one that was created by a priest of my diocese, Father Robert Lebel, for the International Eucharistic Congress that was held in Quebec City in June of 2008. I invite you to share these words of comfort and joy as they relate to the beauty and greatness of the Eucharist. They also resonate as a challenge as we are sent to spread God's gift of peace and reconciliation throughout the world. And as Pope Francis asks us to do, go out. Go out and offer to all the life of Jesus Christ. Give them yourselves to eat. 
Now, if you will bear with me, I will sing this refrain once, and then I will invite you to join me in singing it a second time. O oh God, source of life, we thank You for the gift, this bread and wine for the life of the world. United in praise, we come to the feast to take in our hands God's gift for life. For this we praise You, Lord. For this we praise You, Lord. Please stand. Maestro, music please. Let's all sing together. You have the words. peace of Christ the Eucharist, you can continue to count on Him. He is an inexhaustible source of peace and reconciliation. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. Érsek urat visszahívnánk, de sajnos azért az idő feszít bennünket. Noha ő azért már beénekelt, és hát szolgáljunk itt egy jó információval, hogy folytatódik az éneklés és a zene. Ugyanis a kongresszus hírnökeként mindjárt színpadra lép. Miklósa Erika, a kicsomogyító Dániel kísér majd Orgonán. Miklós Erika bár a sporttal kezdte, egy baleset miatt szembesülnie kellett azzal az érzéssel, hogy most újra kell tervezni. Az éneklés szeretete miatt végül a művészi életpálya felé fordult, és komoly munkával már egész fiatalon, 19 évesen szerződtették a Magyar Állami Operaházhoz. Mannheimben mutatkozott be a Varázs Puvola az ég királynőjének szerepében, amelyel csak hamar meghódította a világ összes jelentős színpadát, Londontól Párizsig, Münchentől New Yorkig. Ő lett a legkeresettebb művész ebben a szerepben, amelyet mára több mint 500-szor énekelt. Szívén viseli az egészséggel, a sporttal, a jótékonysággal és a tehetséggondozással kapcsolatos ügyeket is. 2011-ben az önkéntesség magyarországi nagykövete volt, 2012-ben nemzetközi fair play díjat kapott. 2013-ban, amikor Los Angelesben énekült, átrepült, átrepült egészen New Yorkig, hogy lefussa a maratont. Előadásában Handel a Messiás című oratóriumából a Rejoice árját, majd pedig Bach és Gúnó közösét, az Ave Máriát hallhatják. Fogadják nagyon sok szeretettel.
Thank you very much. Miklós Erika hangja, mint hogyha az égből szólt volna hozzánk, teljesen beleborzongtunk mi is a színpad mögött. Köszönjük ezt a csodás előadást. Most pedig következzék a tanúság tétel. A legrégebbi keresztény közösség azon a területen él, ahonnan a mai tanúság tevőnk érkezett. Louis Raphael Szakó bíboros bagdadi érsek, kát katolikus pátriárka Irakból, aki 2013-ban vette át a kát katolikus egyház vezetését. Egy olyan időszakban, amikor az iszlám állam nem kimért sem embert, sem a világ örökség részét képező pótolhatatlan kulturális emlékeket. A vérontás, a pusztítás közepette Szákó bíboros megrázó segélykiáltásaival, határozott kiállásával ráirányította a világ és a nemzetközi keresztény közösség figyelmét az iraki és a szíriai eseményekre, így a keresztény üldözésre is. A háború, a vérengzés elől az egymilliós lélekszámú katolikus közösség fele elmenekült otthonából, sokan az országból is. A pátriárka a párbeszéd híve. Számos muszlim családokat segítő humanitárius akcióban vett részt személyesen. Mindig kihangsúlyozza az ilyen találkozások során, keresztények vagyunk, mellettük állunk, testvérek vagyunk. Nem vagyunk hitetlenek, a hitetlenek azok, akik üldöztek minket, és akik rosszat tettek nekünk és nekik is. Louis Rafael Szakó és a keresztény közösség számos külföldi ország köztük hazánk támogatásával Rengeteget dolgozik azért, hogy az emberek visszatérhessenek újjáépülő otthonaikba, és elkezdhessenek egy másik, nyugodtabb életet. Köszöntsék őt nagyon nagy szeretettel! to text, see my text. So first of all, I want to thank His Eminence, the uh, Cardinal Erdo, for inviting me to participate in this uh, uh, event, which is not an event for the Hungarian population, but I think for the whole world. And um, 
You know, in this critical time of wars uh, and conflicts in the Middle East, but also the pandemic, I think this event should bring to the whole world uh, an appeal of uh, fraternity and uh, peace. And Christians all over the world should be not troublemakers, but peacemakers. And uh, as I heard uh, Cardinal uh, uh, Lacroix saying uh, that Jesus, after the res his resurrection, said, peace be, be with you. So in our uh, Chaldean Mass, twice we say, peace be, be with you. First, in the beginning of the Mass, I, uh, in the beginning uh, of reading the Gospel, the celebrant says, peace be, we, be with you. This is the Word of God, the peace of the Word of God. But also, uh, before the, the communion, when he is uh, breaking the, the big host in two pieces and put them together and lifting, lifting them uh, up, saying, peace be with you, this is also the peace of the Eucharist in, uh, in our community. So I think this is very essential to have peace. Without peace, there is no, no life, no freedom, no stability as we are uh, living in, in the Middle East, in, uh, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, and this is a pity. Also, I, I want to uh, thank the Hungarian uh, government for their support, uh, the Christians in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, and other, other countries. And I, I have some pictures, you know, I don't know if you can see them, about the work. Because with this help, many villages and the houses of people, displaced people, have been restored. And now many of them, I think 60% of them, are back to their villages in the Nineveh Plain or uh, in other uh, cities. The Middle Eastern Christian drama has been going on for years, not now, for only now. The pressures are though and the immigration hemorrhage <clears throat> continues in countries such as Iraq, Syria, and now Lebanon, Holy Land, <clears throat> unfortunately, the West is not aware of the difficulties and fears that Christians are facing in various countries. Radicalism, terror, as a political and religious ideology is growing more and more in the Middle East. And the Christians are innocent victims, regardless of their education. Extremists want to take advantage of the current situation to mark the end of Christians' presence in Middle East. Many have left the country, making life difficult for those who wish to stay and continue their testimony with enthusiasm and persistence. Since Middle Eastern Christians are the root of Christianity, we believe that their presence is crucial and they rely on your support, your prayers, but also your solidarity. My example in this speech will be uh, focusing on Chaldean Church, which is similar to other churches in the part of the world. Historic background, Christianity entered Mesopotamia, now Iraq, around the end of the first century, according to the, uh, the tradition, St. Thomas the Apostle was the first one to evangelize those religions through his trip to India. He is uh, considered the patron of the Church of the East. Church of the East is the Chaldean Church now. After finishing his mission in Mesopotamia, St. Thomas went to India, bringing the good news to the people of, uh, in, uh, of Kerala region, 
and the Christians of the Malabar coast are still knowing as Christians of St. Thomas, Malabar, and Malankara. They are still using the Chaldean liturgies tra uh, translated after Vatican II into Malayalam, the local uh, dialect. The apostles preached normally wherever there were Jewish community and uh, because uh, of the biblical faith and background uh, and also the language, as it was the case in Mesopotamia after the exile of the Jews uh, in uh, 5,087 uh, 5, uh, before Christ. That is why our liturgy is a Jewish Christian liturgy. A synod, which was the first of its kind in 410, under the auspice of Patriarch Isaac, gathered 40 bishops, and a number of crucial decisions were issued that, uh, concerning dogma, administration, and ritual practices, such as the adoption of the Nicene Creed. Having a single leader of the church, the Archbishop Celestia Tesifonte, and the management system of dioceses. The openness of, to the world, history witnessed, and incomparable evangelization carried out by the Church of the East that extended to the Far East from Sumatra Island. Sri Lanka, the Indian Malabar coast, and China. And in the Middle Ages, we, uh, th this church uh, had 220 dioceses, and th the number of their, the faithful were about 80, 80 million. At that time, the, the church of the East, or the Chaldean church, was a little bit the Catholic church, universal church in that time. Martyrdom is, it is charisma. Until now, the Chaldean church had no external designs and building decoration because it didn't exist in a Christian state. We don't have this uh, Byzantine triumphalism. It is very simple, but very deep. Yeah. However, it is a beauty is from within not outside in the liturgy, spirituality, and martyrs who sacrifice their lives for their faith and still are up to today. Martyrdom is the charisma, charm of the Chaldean church because since it is founding, it has been through persecution by, the, by Persians, Muslim Arabs, Mongols, Ottomans, and today by extremists like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. <clears throat> you know, in one night, in one night, in uh, uh, two, uh, 2014, 120,000 uh, uh, people left their homes and their houses without nothing, with only with their clothes. And we admire that no one left uh, his faith. No one was converted to Islam just to stay at home and be protected. All of them, they left their, uh, their houses to, uh, to other uh, cities in Kurdistan. Yeah. And uh, maybe you, re you remember uh, in uh, you know, uh, two, uh, 2010, uh, in Baghdad on October 31st, where uh, 48 people killed during the mass. And among them, two young people, two young G uh, priests. They went to, to speak uh, to the, you know, to the uh, terrorists saying, you can take us, you can kill us, but uh, please let the others go out. They didn't uh, accept their, uh, you know, their uh, proposal and they killed them both of them, and I have had them in the seminary when I was rector of the seminary. Our Christology, this is something 
special, you know. We are uh, a Catholic church, but in the Catholic church is also diversity. And this is a richness. See, since the Church of the East was outside the borders for the Impero of the Roman Empire and isolated to the it is geographic and political situ uh, situations, it didn't participate in the ecumenical councils at that time, Ephesus or Chalcedonian. Uh, also, it is not right to name it as an historian church. Nestorian, Nestorius was the patriarch of Constantinople, but not in Mesopotamia. There is nothing to do with him. And his language was Greek, and here the language is, was Syriac. This, uh, you know, this Christology is based on synoptic gospels from human to God in contrast to the, the, the descending person according to the Alexandrian description, description from God to man counting on the word logos as stated in the beginning of St. John's Gospel. When I am, I am speaking to them, this man is, uh, you know, the son of God. This is giving me a lot of hope. I can also be the man of God or the son of God. Uh, just like Jesus, to imitate Jesus. But if he is uh, coming from, uh, from the, uh, you know, from heaven, and uh, it, 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 this is very difficult, you know, to imitate him because I am a human being and he is the son of God coming up from, uh, you know, up uh, to below. It is, it is not easy, you know. However, the differences are related to vocabulary according to the Christological statement issued by St. Pope John Paul II and the Patriarch of the, uh, the Church of the East uh, in 1994 in Rome. The Chaldean Catholic Church, when Crusaders occupied the Holy Land, Western missionaries came to the East, and in Cyprus, the first uh, denomination given uh, to, uh, to the Christian community in, uh, I mean, the uh, Chaldean community in Cyprus was um, in uh, 13, uh, 40, uh, 40, uh, was the bishop of Cyprus was called, uh, was considers a, a Catholic bishop, and his community was called uh, Chaldean, but also later in the, uh, the Council of Ferrara, Florence, a big community from Cyprus was also called uh, Chaldean Catholic, but without the denomination, the Sea of Babylon, and now in our synod will change. We, we are no more the patriarch of Babylon of, uh, for Chaldeans, we are the patriarch of Chaldeans only. We took out Babylon. Today, the Chaldean church has uh, 18 dioceses, eight in Iraq and two in Iran, and the bishop, the, you know, the ex-bishop of uh, Tehran is among us. Now he's the bishop or archbishop of Istanbul. One in Syria, one in Lebanon, one in Egypt, and one in Turkey, two in America, and one in Canada, and one in Australia. The number of the faithful is more than one million. The Eastern spirituality, Oriental spirituality is a project to know deeply the person of Christ and to be integrated with him. Jesus Christ is the, the head of the salvation, what we call oikonomia, which is realized in the church, the community, his mystical body, and ultimately inside the faithful when there is a gradual marching during the, liturg the liturgical year, I mean seasons, as we go through different stages of salvation history, living the real theological and moral meaning to be crowned eventually by the sanctification of the church. This is also an 
eschatological dimension. This uh, spirituality starts from the grace, the grace of God. So it is very positive, nothing negative. And we, rare, rare we are speaking about mortification. Or the cross, even our cross is empty without body because he is risen. And we, we, we call it the glory is the cross. And this is giving us a lot of hope during our persecutions. Also through continuous personal and communal meditation in the, the mystery of Christ and the church. It is forming program grounded on reflection and meditation and essential and predestination subject that form a Christian community. Based on this, the Eastern liturgy, um, not only the Chaldean liturgy, but also Antiochian liturgy, Maronite and Syriac, places a permanent shining light in the middle of the temple to illuminate the tables of the Eucharist and also the Holy Bible. That means to shed the light on Jesus Christ, to honor him and to follow his example. A Christian faithful without a mystical spiritual experience is incomplete. Christian must have some mystical experience which is not an exceptional situation, not only for the monks and the religious, it's for everyone, for everyone. Spirituality means that we let the Holy Spirit pray inside us to lead us to know the mystery of God rather than to be isolated from the world by having a direct knowledge of God as our Father. So the Holy Spirit, to leave the Holy Spirit, bring us something from, from God to our knowledge and to our life. This is sort of knowledge should increase in the midst of the detail, our detailed uh, daily uh, life, and we should be witness for that. You know, sometimes Muslims are asking us, why Christians are different? They are asking, some, some Christians, we are different because we believe in Christ, and the, the behavior, the example of Christ should be our example. So we need to witness something different from them to them. According to the Eastern tradition, there are two conditions for the spiritual life. A commitment to follow the example of Jesus Christ. And this is, you know, maybe the, the purpose or the scope of this uh, Eucharistic Congress. This is based on a radical divine love relationship similar to be wedded couples convent. We receive the Eucharist, the body of Christ, until it is transformed to us. This body is for me, that I should be also the body of Christ, to reflect his body to the others. That is, we take some, something from him. Each day we, we take something from Christ to put it on, on us to be in order to be transformed to him. This is the transubiation, it may be. What for? Why I am doing that? Because I love that son. I have become a son who joins uh, the one who does not die is also not dead. Who is pleased with life becomes alive. So I am taking something because he is eternal. He is alive. I am taking something from him to put it on me to, to have the eternal life. And this is, you know, uh, the hymn is in our liturgy, a hymn of Solomon. The second one is practicing deep prayer or spiritual and mystic heart prayers. This emotional practice 
allows the faithful to unite with God through prostration and thanksgiving, providing us with power, light, and peace during a daily struggle. The, the prayer is not a structure. Even liturgy should be not a structure. This is something from the heart. And our problem is uh, in the Middle East because we are also speaking with our heart, not with our mind. We are very sentimental, emotional, because we love. We are living in, even in our families, we are living close to each other. We cannot live with, uh, without uh, a family. This is very hard for us. The communionship, because here in the, uh, you know, in the West, they are individualism and also um, consu consumation and uh, agnostic. We don't know why, and this is terrible. Now, what is the future of Christian in Iraq and also in, uh, in Lebanon and in, uh, in Syria, especially after Pope's visit? The apostolic visit of Pope Francis to Iraq from 5 to 8 March, uh, 2021, and Iraqi Christians in particular is historical and important lies and supporting a persecuted Christian uh, church that continues to suffer and live in the climate of mistrust and suspicion, which prevents Christians from seeing a future in their own country. Pope Francis visits visit, strengthens Christian faith, and renews their hope as well as filling them with uh, enthusiasm to rebuild the trust and cooperate with their citizens based on a national and spiritual fraternity. He repeated many times, you know, that we are brothers and sisters, but we have to admit that we are different. Even in a family, you know, we are different. We have different names, but sometimes we have different colors. I, am, I have the uh, dark heart. My brother is much more uh, red. The Pope touches the hearts of all Iraqis by these messages, especially Muslims. And now something has changed in the streets, uh, you know, in the mass, the population. Yeah. Christians have, the, you know, very, uh, are, are proud of that, and now they, they are very appreciated also. And when he was speaking to respect each other, we are always, uh, all of, we are all brothers and sisters to live in dignity. And I was with him to visit Ayatollah Asistani, the, the supreme, uh, you know, Shiite authority, and the, the imam said something very important. He said, you are Christians, that means Christians and the Pope. You are a part of us, and we are a part of you. Uh, that means we are brothers. Cardinal uh, uh, Pietro Parolin summarized that what he has learned from this meeting with the Iraqi believers by saying that it is a testimony of faith that reaches the point of martyrdom. This is the great lesson that we can draw today from Iraqi Christians. Despite the attacks and murders, Christians in Iraq continue to proclaim their Catholic faith with great courage. We are not ashamed to say we are Christians. Sometimes here, you know, in the West, maybe people have no courage to say that we are, they are Christians. They are agnostic. It is a great teaching of the Pope. He added that they 
teach us the ability of the, to be honest in spite of all difficulties. This is the call of solidarity. Christians share the same dream that with Iraqis and also in Lebanon and Syria, the population, I, I don't mean the politicians. The politicians are looking for the power and money, and this is corruption. So the, to live in peace, stability, equality, and dignity, I mean citizenship. And we, I am always asking from Iraqi government, you know, to separate religion from the state. They are two th different things. I am an Iraqi citizen. It doesn't matter. I am Christian or I am Muslim, I believe or not. But I am Iraqi. They would appreciate every help to achieve that. The only solution is to have a strong secular civil state and real democracy similar to the one applied in most countries of the world. The secular regime embraces and protects all religions, cultures, groups, and languages, manages public affairs fairly, and protects them. The civil state does not interfere with the religious uh, choices of its citizens and does not elevate its politics to an ideological doctrine, sectarian. The Americans brought us sectarian, sect, sectarianism. Before that, there was no sect, sectarian mentality among Iraq. We were not asking, you are Muslim, you are Shiite, you are Sunnite, you are a Christian, you are Kurds. Never. I am Iraqi. It is a requirement to separate religion from politics. The international community should help Iraqis to implement this vital project. On the other hand, and in order to stop the immigration of Christians, it is necessary to improve the situation of their cities and villages, as Hungarian government uh, did. And now there is a big a town in, uh, in Nineveh plain called Teleskov. They call it the daughter of Hungarian government or of Hungary. Conclusion. This International Eucharistic Congress should be an opportunity for every Christian to deepen his incorporation into Christ and then to strengthen communion and unity among them through their membership in the church. Each Eucharistic celebration is a celebration of Last Supper and carries the meaning of sharing and being together. Let us complete our spiritual journey to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who will not leave us in darkness, but will shine with the light of his resurrection uh, on us. I, I, I suggest that from this Eucharistic Congress, you can launch an appeal for uh, peace and fraternity and to stop you know, the, the voices of uh, weapons and wars and killing each uh, other. I think that will be also from, from the background of our faith and the Eucharist. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.
Kedves vendégeink, felhívjuk a figyelmüket egy közelmúltban történt változásra, ami a holnapi egyik szent misét illeti. A passzázson található óriás plakáton a Szent József templom szerepel, a szlovák nyelvű mise helyszínéül, viszont ez a budapesti magyarok nagyasszonya templomban lesz. Tehát hangsúlyozzuk, hogy a holnapi szlovák szent mise helyszíne a budapesti magyarok nagyasszonya temploma lesz. We would like to inform you that tomorrow the Slovak Holy Mass will be held in the Magyarok Nagyasszonya Templom in Budapest instead, instead of the St. Joseph Church. On the poster, what you can see outside on the passage, it is written in the wrong way. So please pay attention to the change. The Holy Mass in the Slovak language will be held in the Magyarok Nagyasszonya Church. Most pedig hamarosan egy rövid szünetet tartunk, a Szent Mise 11 óra 30 perckor kezdődik, addigra kérünk mindenkit, hogy ismét foglalja el a helyét. A Szent Misére kérjük az atyákat, hogy a színpaddal szemben a számukra fenntartott helyen foglaljanak helyet. Az ültetésben önkénteseink segítenek, a Szent Misét követően pedig ebéd szünet lesz. Itt még elhangzik az az információs, információ is, hogy a Rezső téren lesz ez a Szent Mise, amit az előbb említettünk, hogy ugye ez még egy nagyon fontos dolog, hogy a Rezső térre legyenek szívesek majd menni. Tehát ele, így van. There will be a short break before Mass, which will begin promptly at 11.30 a.m. by the time everyone should return to their seats. For the Mass, priests are kindly requested to take the seats allocated opposite the stage. Our volunteers will be available to assist with seating. There will be a lunch before break following the mass. Most pedig engedjék meg, hogy bemutassam a mai Szent Mise főcelebránsát, akivel perceken belül találkozni fognak. Ma egy olyan érsek celebrálja a Szent Misét, aki a legmesszebbről érkezett közénk. Hozé Szerofiá Pálma a Fülöp-szigetekről 11 ezer kilométer megtétele után van itt közöttünk. Szebu érseke átélte és tudja, hogy milyen átható változásokat indíthat el egy nemzetközi eukarisztikus esemény a közösség életében. 2016-ban ugyanis ők voltak a házigazdái a kongresszusnak. Elég, ha csak azt emeljük ki, hogy 5000 utcán kóborló gyermeket ültettek egy asztalhoz a szeretett vendégség során, aztán pedig építettek számukra egy árvaházat. Néhány percen belül fogadjuk Cebu érsekét hasonlóan nagy szeretettel, mint hogy öt évvel ezelőtt ők fogadták hazájukban a kongresszusra érkező magyar küldöttséget. Piros, fehér és zöld színekbe öltöztették a templomkertet, az utcán és a belső terekben molignókon köszöntötték a magyarokat és Erdő Péter bíborost. Az eredeti tervek szerint mintegy 500 Fülöp-szigeteki küldött lett, vett volna részt a budapesti eseményen, azonban a járvány miatt törölni kellett a programot. Az ország fővárosában, Manilában, a Szent Kereszt templomban szeptember 11-én országos, virtuális, eukarisztikus kongresszus tartanak a helyi püspöki konferencia szervezésében. Online térben ugyan, de az eukarisztia által összekapcsolódhatunk az ottani hívekkel is. Szeretettel üdvözöljük testvéreinket és szebú érsekét, Hozé Szerofia Pálmát. A Szent Mise zenei szolgálatát ma a Kodály Zoltán Magyar Kórus Iskola nyújtja, vezényel Sapszon Ferenc, Orgonán Kísér Virág András. Ezen felül a Szent Mise felajánlási énekét a Pécsi Egyházmegyei Horváth dalkör és a Szent Péter Fai Jufcsice dalkör tagjai fogják énekelni. Köszönjük szépen a figyelmet, a szünet után találkozunk, várunk mindenkit vissza szeretettel, áldott Szent Misére való készületet kívánunk.
magam, te hozzád fotok, élő víz lesz szomjazom, közelséget
Egy, kettő. Kedves zarándokok, szeretnénk megkérni mindenkit, hogy lassan foglalják el a helyüket, és csöndben készüljünk együtt a Szentmisére. A mai Szentmisén a könyörgéseket a magyaron kívül ázsiai nyelveken, japán, mandarin, malayalán, kínai és vietnámi nyelveken is felolvassák majd. Tehát szeretnék megkérni mindenkit, hogy lassan foglalják el a helyiket, és csöndben készüljünk együtt a Szentmisére. Perceken belül kezdeni fogunk. Köszönöm szépen!
In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Gratia Domini Neustri Iesu Christi et Caritati Dei or Caritas Dei et Communicatio Sancti Spiritus et Cum Omnibus Vobis. Et Cum Spiritu Tuo. Fratres, agnoscamus peccata nostra, Ot aptisimus ad sacra misteria celebranda. Confetior Dio omnipotenti et vobis fratres, qui applicabi nimis cogitazioni, verbo opere domissioni. Mia culpa, mia culpa, mia maxima culpa. Ed io pracor beata Mariam semper virginem, omnis angelos et sanctus, et vos fratres, orari pro me ad Dominum Deum Nostrum. Mesriator nostri omnipotens Deus, et demesis pecatis nostris, perducat nos ad vitam eternam. Amen.
Sanctorum Martyrum Marci, Stephani et Melchioris, Quesumus Domini, Principus et Juvemur, Ut Quorum Gloriamur, Triumpho, Fide Constantiam Imitemur, Per Dominum Nostrum Iesum Christum Filium Tuum, Que Decum Vivit et Reniat, In Unitatis Spiritus Sancti, Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seemed, in the view of the foolish, to be dead, and their passing away was thought an affliction, and their going forth from us utter destruction. But they are in peace. For if to others, indeed, they seem punished, yet in their hope full of immortality, chastised a little, they shall be greatly blessed because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace, he proved them, and as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. In the time of their judgment, they shall shine and dart about as sparks through stubble. They shall judge nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord shall be their king forever. Those who trust in him shall understand truth, and the faithful shall abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are with his holy ones, and his care is with the elect.
Abban az időben Jézus ezt mondta apostolainak. Ne féljetek azoktól, akik megölik a testet, de a lelket nem tudják megölni. Inkább attól féljetek, aki a lelket is, a testet is a pokolba taszíthatja. Egy fillérért ugye két verebet adnak, és mégsem hull a földre egy se közülük, atyátok tudta nélkül. Nektek pedig minden szál hajatokat számon tartják. Ne féljetek hát, sokkal többet értek ti a verebeknél. Ha valaki megvall engem az emberek előtt, én is megvallom őt atyám előtt, aki a mennyekben van. De ha valaki megtagad engem az emberek előtt, én is megtagadom őt atyám előtt, aki a mennyekben van. Verbum Domini, Lausti
Let me begin by extending to you, my brothers and sisters, the greetings of peace and joy from the Philippines, particularly from Cebu, the host of the 51st International Eucharistic Congress and the cradle of Christianity in the Far East. And this year, our country celebrates the fifth centenary of the arrival of Christian faith on our shores. Today, the psalmist exclaims, what marvels the Lord worked for us. Indeed, we were glad. We are glad to join His Eminence, Cardinal Peter Erdo. My brother bishops and priests and all of you and thousands of delegates for this 52nd International Eucharistic Congress. Personally, I am glad because the patron of our cathedral in Haro, where I was ordained bishop, is Saint Elizabeth of Hungary. We are all glad as we anticipate the coming of our beloved Holy Father, Pope Francis, for the Statue Orbis on November 12, the Day of Love. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, today we are all glad, for we marvel at the Lord's work of gathering us together Despite COVID, despite the pandemic here, and in this historic and beautiful city of Budapest, the Lord gathers us to reflect, to meditate, and celebrate the wondrous gift of the Eucharist. In this Mass, we also celebrate the feast of the Casa Martyrs, Saints Mark, Stephen, and Melchior. That's why this afternoon, many of us are going to Estergom, where they are buried. Our liturgy today also asks us to reflect on the theme of peace, the peace which only God can give. At this point, allow me to then to share with you some thoughts on peace. First, God's peace is about being part of God's family. Our theme for this year's International Eucharistic Congress is All My Springs Are In You, Psalm 87, 7. In this short chapter, we hear the Lord praising Jerusalem as over and above the dwelling places of Jacob, for it is the city which the Lord himself established. However, this privileged status of Jerusalem has been extended by the Lord to all nations, even to the city's enemies, so that everyone will say, this one was born there. And so when all nations together with Jerusalem learn and live the order and peace which God has willed, then Quote, all singers and dancers shall say, All my springs are in you, for creation has reached its goal. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what the psalmist proclaims is actualized in every Eucharistic celebration. In every holy sacrifice, we begin by acknowledging the source of our gathering together, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We also profess to the triune God that all our springs are in them, are from them. 
right at the start of the Holy Mass? Will it go of our social status and the many things that divide us? For we become one family of believers. It is also in every Eucharist, where will it go of our titles and call each other brothers and sisters. And we ask the Lord to make my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to the Almighty Father. It is in this experience of being family, every time the Eucharist is offered and celebrated, that we can truly experience the peace which only God can give. If before peace draws its source from the springs in Jerusalem, today, every time the sacrifice is offered on every altar, peace gushes forth. For in every Eucharist, we become one family of God, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people God calls his own, so that you may announce the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 1 Peter 2.9 Second, peace is not about the absence of pain and suffering, but the realization, the conviction of God's presence in the midst of pain and suffering. Our gospel today is part of the missionary discourse of Jesus in Matthew. In the earlier verses, Jesus speaks about the presence of persecution when, quote, men will deliver them to courts, flog them in synagogues, and be dragged before governors and kings, end quote. Yet despite all this pain and suffering, the Lord assures his apostles in today's gospel not to fear and worry. For if God values these perils, how much more you and me who enjoy familial intimacy with our Father in heaven. Once we realize this truth of divine adoption, by the Father, then no amount of pain and suffering can disturb and destroy the peace that springs from the heart of God. For if God is with us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. Even as in many places, COVID is still around. Yet, because God is with us, we do not give in to fear, but rather, we continue to be steadfast in our faith. Thus, together with Paul, we can boldly profess, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but never destroyed. My first comment when I came over is, the faith of Budapest is greater than the fear of many people. My dear brothers and sisters, our two points on peace, peace as being part of God's family and peace as God's presence in the midst of pain and suffering are perfectly concretized in the lives of Saints Mark, Stephen, and Melchior whose feast we celebrate today. Saint Melchior, who was born into a Polish aristocracy, yet left such privileged life and joined the Society of Jesus. And since Stephen, like Melchior, entered the Jesuits, even if he could have enjoyed living his life in his native Transbania. Saint Mark, who considered his different missions as one single field of apostolic activity, and who was said to have a good relationship with the Calvinists, never treating them as enemies, but brothers and sisters in Christ, even if he was 
killed by them. The lives of these three martyrs of Kessa teach us today that peace is very much attainable despite the presence of pain and suffering. As long as we, in the deepest recesses of our hearts, allow ourselves to become part of one family of God that draws living water from the spring of God's love, the Father in heaven. In his message to the Holy Father during the Mass held in Vatican to commemorate 500 years of Christianity in our country, Cardinal Tegli commenting on our theme, Gifted to Love, or rather, Gifted to Give, said, and I quote, The gift must continue being a gift. It must be shared. If it is kept for itself, it ceases to be a gift. To conclude, my dear brothers and sisters, we who had been gifted and satiated with the spring of God's grace in the Eucharist, we are called henceforth to be bringers of peace to others. Just like a spring that flows freely until it waters and fills every corner and space that it reaches, let us radiate God's peace to all nations, to all peoples, to the ends of the earth, wherever we find ourselves in. And may God's peace be with us always as we go forth in fulfilling this mission. And may our Blessed Mother, the Queen of Peace, intercede for us all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we turn to our Lord Jesus Christ, who reveals to the world in the heroism of martyrs the value of true faith and the holiness of sacrifice. Sister, now, Anatani, Jujitsu no Tameni Tizikata. あなたの宗教者たちのために Dominum de pretimum, akik téged követve keresztüket vállalták, add, hogy az élet minden baját mi is erős lélekkel viseljük. Dominum de pretimum, các thánh tử đạo đã nhuộm áo mình cho máu con chim xin cho chúng con thoát khỏi mọi cạm bẫy của thể xác và thế gian dominum de Our Anger Pambarin Velo Adwale 
എല്ലാ മനുഷ്യമായ വിശ്വാസികളെയും ഞങ്ങളുടെ രാജ്യത്തിലേക്ക് പ്രവേശിപ്പിക്കാറാകണമേ Jesus Christ our victorious king you see how weak we are without you stand by your people during their times of tribulation and strengthen them with your spirit you will live and reign forever and ever amen
Dati fratres ut meum ag vestrum sacrificium, acceptabili fiat apud Deum Patrem Unipotentem. Ostias tebi Domine, pro commemorazione viatoro marci, Stephanie, et melchiori soferimus, supplicita di precentes, ot sicut elis pribuestis sacrifici e claritatem, sic nobis indulgensam, largiaris et pacem, per Christum Dominum nostrum. Sagamos Domino Deo Nostro. Veridinium et justum est, equum et salutare, nos tibio semper et obigui gracias agere, Domini Sancti Pater Omnipotens Eterni Deus, quoniam Beate Marteris Marcos, Stephanos et Melchior, pro confessione nomenis Tue, ad imitationem Christi, sanguis e fusus tua mirabilia manifestat, quibus fervices et fragilitate vertutem, et veris infirmas a testimonium roboras per Christum Dominum nostrum, et idio cum cilorum vertutibus in terres te iugiter celebramus, maestate tue sine fine clamantes. Sanctus es Domini, fons omnis sanctitatis, e cargo dona quesum o spiritus tu errore santifica, ot nobis corpus et sanguis fiant Domini nostri Iesu Christi. Pri compassioni voluntari et rederetur, ac capit panem et grasas agens fregit, diret que discipulis suis dicens, ac cipite et manducate ex hoc omnis. Hoc est enim corpus meium, quod progubis tradetur. Simili modo postquam cenatum est, accipiens et calicem, Iterum tibi gracias agens de de discipulis suis dicens, accipite et vivite ex eio omnes, ic est enim calic sanguinis mei, nobit eterni testamenti, qui provobis et promultis e fundetur in remissionem peccatorum, hoc facite in meiam commemorationem. Mysterium Fidei. Morgen Tua, Anunciamus Domine, et Tua Resurrectione Confidemus, Tore Premias. 
memoris igitur mortis et resurrectionis cui eius divi domini panem vite et calicem salutis offerimus gracias a gentis quia nos dinios abuiste a stare curam te et tibi ministrari et supplices de precamor ut corpores et sanguinis Christi participes a Spiritus Sancto conigamor in cum. Recordare Domine Ecclesiae tu et toto orbe diffuse, utiam in caritate perficias una cum Papa nostro Francisco, et Episcopo nostro Petro, et Universo Clero. Memento etiam fratrum nostrorum, qui in spe resurrectionis dormierunt, omnium qui in tua miserazione defuntorum, et eus in lumen vultus tui admitte. Omnium nostrum quesumus miserere, ut cum beata Dei genetrice Virgine Maria, beato Iosef, eius ponso, beatis apostolis et omnibus sanctis, qui tibi a seculo plaquerunt, eterni viti meriamurese consortes, et te laudimus et glorificemus per filium tuum, Iesum Christum. Per ipsum, et cum ipsu et in ipsum, est ibidio patria omnipotenti, in unitate spiritu sancti, omnis honor et gloria, per omnia secula seculo, Precepti salutaribus muniti, et divine institutione formati, audemus dicere. Quesimus Domini ad omnibus malis, da propitius pacem in diebus nostris, ut ope misericordia tui adiute, et de peccatus simus semper libere, et ab omni perturbatione secure, expectantes biatam spem, et adventum salvatoris nostri, Iesu Christi. Viatum esperem, potes as, et gloria, Domini Iesu Christe, quid existi apostolis tuis, pacem relinquo bovis, pacem meiam do bovis. Ne respicias peccata nostra, sed fidem eclesia tue, iamque secundum voluntatem tuam, pacificari et quagionari dinieris, qui vives et renias in secula seculorum. Amen. Pax Domini, sit semper boviscum. Et Baranyo, elveszed a világ bűneit. Nyilvánvaz nekünk, és 
Isten bárányom, elveszed a világ bűneit. Írgalmaz nekünk! Isten bárányom, elveszed a világ bűneit. Ecce agnus Dei, ecce qui tolit peccatam mundi, vieti qui ad cenem agni vocati sunt. Domine de nostri intercessi, ut intres suplectum meum, sed tantum dic verbo, et sanabitur anima mea.
Concedi nobis Domine, per ex sacramenta celestia, gratiam in viatorum martyrum, marci, Stephanit Melchioris, celebritati multiplicem, o te de tanti agone certamenes discamos, et firma solidari pacientia, et pia exultare victoria, per Christum Dominum nostrum. Kedves vendégeink, engedjék meg, hogy még a mise vége és az áldás előtt néhány technikai információt osszunk meg önökre, önökkel a nap folytatásáról. A Szent Mise után ebédszünet lesz. A plenáris teremmel szemközti F és G pavilonokban várjuk önöket szeretettel a kihelyezett büféknél. Az ebédet illetően kérjük a kedves zarándokok együttműködését a szervezőkkel, hogy az ebéd kiosztása gördülékenyen menjen. Az ebédet követően a délutáni fakultációk 14 óra 30 perckor kezdődnek az A, a B, az E1 és az E2-es pavilonokban. A szünetben kivetítjük a fakultációk címeit és választhatnak, hogy melyiken szeretnének részt venni. Kérjük, hogy időben érkezzenek meg a kiválasztott fakultációs termekhez, kezdés előtt legalább 10 perccel. Annak pedig, aki gyónni szeretne, az ebédszünetben lesz erre lehetősége a kápolna előterében, amelyet a B pavilon túlsó oldalán találnak. És tisztelettel kérjük az atyákat, hogy minél többen gyóntassanak. Before the end of Mass and before the blessing, please allow us to give you some technical information on the rest of the day. After the Mass, there will be a lunch break, and you are welcome to visit the buffets in pavilions F and G, opposite the plenary hall. With regard to the lunch, we kindly ask the pilgrims to cooperate with the organizers to ensure a smooth distribution of the lunch. After lunch, the afternoon facultations will start at 14.30 in pavilions A, B, E1, and E2. During the break, the titles of the facultations will be displayed, from which you can choose the one you would like to attend. Please arrive to the selected facultation on time, at least 10 minutes before the start. Those wishing to confess will have the opportunity to do so during the lunch break in the foyer of the chapel, which can be found on the other side of Pavilion B. We kindly ask our priests to make the confession possible. Köszönöm a figyelmet. Thank you for your attention. Dominus Bobiscum, et Set nomen Domine Benedictum, et nostrum, in nomine Domine, et benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater, et filius, et spiritus sanctus.
We would like to inform you that tomorrow the Slovak Holy Mass will be held in the Magyarok Nagyasszonya Templom in Budapest instead of the Saint Joseph Church. Igen, itt a <laughs> atya segít, tehát hogy mindenképpen a Rezső tére kell. A, a Magyarok, Magyarok Nagyasszonya tére holnap itt lesz. Köszönjük szépen, ilyen gyorsan megy az információ, tehát hogy mindenki holnap oda menjen, aki a szlovák Szent Misén szeretne részt venni, és hogyha megengedik, akkor még angolul is bemondom. Uh, so I would like to say that tomorrow the Slovak Holy Mass will be held in the Magyarok Nagyasszonya Church instead of the Szent József Church. Thank you. És akkor következzék a szellemi táplálék. Valahogy úgy képzeltem el az életet, mint az iskolát. Azt gondoltam, hogy Isten egy unalmas matek tanár, aki azt várja tőlem, hogy unalmas dolgokat tegyek a jó jegyekért. Ami pedig örömöt okoz, azt megtiltja. Így emlékezett vissza a bulikkal és az esztelenségekkel tarkított lázadó korszakára Johannes Hartl, német teológus, irodalomtudós, filozófus, négy gyermekes családapa. 14 éves korában a szülei magukkal vitték egy vallási konferenciára a rebellis hippi fiút. Nem imádkoztam. Csak ott álltam, és nem éreztem semmit. Mikor vége lett az imának, visszamentem a helyemre, és akkor éreztem, hogy valami megváltozott bennem. Ez a nap egyszerűen ketté vágta az életemet. Az egész addigi világképem összedőlt. Hogy miért? Mert megtaláltam Istent, pedig nem tettem érte semmit. Ezekkel a szavakkal idézte fel később az akkor történteket. 2005-ben feleségével megalapították az imádságházát, ahol a nap 24 órájában folyamatosan szünet nélkül zajlik az ökumenikus imádság. Köszöntsék nagy szeretettel, Johannes Hartlut! Good afternoon. What a joy to be with you all. Let me just start with a short prayer. Holy Spirit, we invite you to open up our ears to make us receive from God. Come with your wisdom and your clarity. Reveal Jesus in a deeper way to our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So good to be with you. It's a real privilege and honor to be here, especially to be one of the few Germans here. I feel like I'm the only one. Any, anybody else from Germany here? Right. Yeah, so this afternoon, I'm going to share a story of hope. It's very personal to me, and I know if you hear something from Germany and hope, that doesn't go together well, right? Because normally, if it comes about faith and church, you think from Germany, I mean, in Germany, people aren't believing so much anymore, right? When I went to Poland some years ago, I was reported, I was interviewed by a Catholic newspaper. And the first question was, aha, uh -huh, you're from Germany. Can anything good come from Germany? That was the first question. Yeah, I have good news for you. In the Old Testament, God spoke through a donkey. So God can all, he can even use Germans to do something, right? But <laughs> because I'm going to share a part of my, of my personal experience of my story. But to disappoint all of you, I'm not even a real German. Because my grandmother was Hungarian. Yeah. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, she didn't teach me any Hungarian, with one exception. There's one thing I learned. Pay attention. Who's from Hungary here? Okay. Gera kecska kombocska. Okay. This is this is the only Hungarian I know, cousin. Um, <laughs> again. So this afternoon I'm going to speak about beauty, and I called this message the fascination of beauty. Maybe we can have that on the screen. Thank you. I'm going to speak about the fascination of beauty. I, it was, it was good. I didn't understand the introduction because that was in Hungarian, so no idea what they said about me. I don't know even if it's true, but just some, some things about me personal. I'm Johannes, 42 years old. I'm married, one wife, four kids. Uh, yeah, so. That's what they look like. The big, one, the big one is my wife. The smaller ones are the kids, right? So yeah, that's my wife. And some years ago, my wife and I started something special. I was at university, and then we had the impression we are supposed to found, start a house of prayer. So what is a house of prayer? Well, it is a house, this is the house, um, that used to be a fitness studio. So we bought it, and now it's a different kind of a fitness studio. Different kind of fitness taking place there. i just tell you some things about the House of Prayer. The main place, the main room in the House of Prayer is the prayer room. It's not a very big room, it seats maybe 100 people. Sometimes there are many people. Sometimes there is only a handful. But this is not the special thing about that prayer room. The special thing is that it never stops. So if you go there in the afternoon at 3, you have a group of people praying. You go there in the morning at 8, you have a group of people praying. If you go there 3 o'clock in the night, you have a group of people praying. Next Saturday, we're going to celebrate a very special date because this will be our 10th anniversary of non-stop prayer. So, <laughs> so we, have a, we have a prayer group that is, has, has been going on for around 100,000 hours now. And it's special for us, especially that during the night and in the morning and the 365 days a year, prayer never stops, and it's mainly young people who do this. It's Christians from different denominations, so this is an ecumenical expression. We do at our conferences, for example, also have Eucharist adoration, but our main expression in the prayer room is a very free floating form of prayer with worship and music in this ecumenical spontaneous style. And then we have some guest rooms and seminar rooms and things, and we even have a beautiful oratory, a chapel. And if you think about it, okay, you have a group of young people in Germany praying at 4 a.m. in the morning. You could say to yourself, who cares? I mean, who's interested in that? It's just five or ten people praying. So more than ten years ago, we thought, well, probably it, it's, it's going to stay hidden and small, like a small, like a hermit on the mountain or something like that. And then we had our first conference. We just invited friends who wanted to know about what we're doing, and 100 20 people showed up. We were so overwhelmed. So many people. 120. And then next year, the same conference, a prayer conference. Conference about prayer. It was 250 people coming. And one year later, 
it was 1,000 people coming. And we couldn't explain it. So our little, small, tiny house of prayer, prayer conference, some years later, looked like this. Um, and it was 3,000 people. And our little house of prayer, prayer conference, some years later, looked like this. And the last time we did it, last year, it looked like this, and we had 12,000 people in Germany. Um, I'm not telling that to brag or to say, oh, isn't that cool to have 12,000 people? That's not the main thing. But I ask myself the question, what is the secret behind that? How is that possible? What can we learn? And this afternoon, I want to share five principles with you that I have learned about basically how to do church, how to live a Christian life, especially in a country like Germany, which is very secular. And these are five elements or five lessons that I personally have drawn from this story. Actually, I love this picture very much because this picture was taken by a TV studio and it was broadcasted in German mainstream secular news. It was 6 p.m. or 8 p.m., like the biggest news show, and they had the title of the conference was Holy Fascination. Yeah? And the news, the news story had the very same title as a headline. It says, said, Holy Fascination, 10,000 Christians gather. And they brought that very picture in the news. And I loved the fact that Christians were known for fascination because oftentimes we, as Catholics, we are known for what we are against. As a Catholic, you are against this, you are against this, you are against this. And that's okay, but I dream of a church who's known for her fascination. What are we burning for? not what we are against, what we are fascinated for. The world is filled with negativity and with different groups fighting against other groups. And then you have the Christians, they also have their little fight. But who are people who are burning with fascination? I think this is important. So. Maybe you say, well, fascination, this is not a real biblical term. No, nowhere in the Bible you find the word fascination. I do believe the New Testament, the Old Testament as well, the New Testament is filled with the concept of fascination. They just use other, other, other words. Just when Peter and John are interrogated at the court in Jerusalem, they try to silence them. They say, you're not longer allowed to preach. This is what they answer. But Peter and John replied, whether it is right before God to obey you rather than God, you decide. For it is impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. So, John and Paul, they don't say, oh, we, you know, we've studied theology, so we have to speak about theology. This is our job. No, they were fascinated. They said, we cannot be silent. The same thing when, when, when people encountered Jesus. They couldn't turn away their eyes. My first point is fascination is at the center of the Christian life. It is a central topic. Are we fascinated for Jesus? See, there are, 
There are some funny stories in the gospel. <laughs> For example, once there is some, some policemen actually sent to arrest Jesus, right? They come and they want to arrest Jesus. But then they come back and they have not arrested Jesus. So they get asked, so why didn't you arrest Jesus? And they say, no man has ever spoken like this man. See, even his enemies couldn't help but be fascinated by him. There is a beautiful TV show coming right now into Europe. It's called The Chosen. Anybody heard about The Chosen? You have to check it out. It's, it's a great, it's a TV series like Netflix about the life of Jesus. And it's done so perfectly because you see Jesus was not, he wasn't this boring guy preaching, you know, No, no, no. You know, he was a fascinating personality. This is the chosen. You have to check it out. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's very good. Fascination is supposed to be at the core of the Christian life. It's so important. The gospel is not primarily about what you do, but it's primarily who you love. I'm going to come back to this point at the second point. So, why is that? Why is fascination so important? It is so important because it's the way us humans are made. Why is it that only we humans create arts? Only we create music? The elephant does not compose anything. Neither the zebra, they don't paint, they don't dance, they don't write novels, they don't play drama, they don't compose music. It's only humans who do that. We have a desire for this. The oldest monuments of human mankind were already beautiful adorned. This temple in Egypt was built something like 2,000 before Christ, and it's, it's carved with the most beautiful patterns. Humans have created beautiful places, beautiful buildings like this. This is, uh, is Saint-Chapelle in, in, in Paris, because there is something in our heart that longs for beauty and fascination. And there is a reason why this is. Why is it humans have this longing in their heart? Now, we're doing a little bit theology now, but we do it with pictures, so it's easier. So, if you look at creation, if you look at nature, one very interesting thing is the fact that it is filled with beauty. Wherever you go, Like, for example, this picture. Have a guess. Where is this? What country could this be? Yeah, that's, that's Ireland. Northern Ireland. Or this, you know? It's, this is Switzerland. It's interesting. Wherever you look, you have different forms of beautiful land, landscapes. This, of course, it's very green, you have a lot of water, this is beautiful. But even the desert can be very beautiful. Look at this picture. This is dramatic. It's very beautiful. Or think about the ocean. If I would ask you, where is the ocean the most beautiful? What would you answer? Yeah, a, a true Hungarian would answer in Hungary. Yeah, but. Just kidding. <laughs> the ocean is beautiful wherever in, 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 in England. The ocean is beautiful in the southern seas. I, I, I show you one picture where I actually, where I once was. I once was there. This is in Seychelles Islands. This is very beautiful. 
But the ocean even is beautiful when it's frozen, like here. This is an Iceland, and it's also very beautiful. It's very difficult to find a spot on the ocean that, that it's, which is not beautiful. Or think about flowers, right? Which flower is the most beautiful one? Let's take, is this flower more beautiful or this? Which one? Well, they're all beautiful, right? Yeah, I mean, okay, okay. Here comes the biologists. And the biologists say, you know, this flower is only beautiful to attract the bees. Because the bee sees the beautiful flower, and you know, the bees and the flowers, you know, they come together and they produce little flowers, you know. Okay. So this is how they explain it. Yeah, that's partially true. Because there are many beautiful parts in nature where there are no bees and no flowers and no procreation at all. If you take a space telescope and you watch the sky at night, there are stars out there that look like this. There is never ever a bee coming around any of those stars. Nothing procreating up there, but it's incredibly beautiful. It's interesting, nature is filled with beauty. If you walk around, let's say, in the forest, and you somewhere see something ugly, probably humans have thrown it there, or have built it there, because normally nature is beautiful. It is interesting, right? If God creates something, it looks like this. If humans create something, it sometimes looks like this. So what's the difference? Well, God created beauty. Why do we as humans have a desire for fascination? Simple answer. Because God is fascinating. We wouldn't thirst if there was no water. The fact that we as humans thirst proves that water exists. Human beings have a deep desire for fascination because the source of the universe, of everything, He Himself, the Creator, is the essence of beauty and fascination. And friends, we have to speak about that. Because this is central to the gospel. Let's jump to a Bible verse, which probably is unfamiliar to you. It's not a very famous Bible verse. It is a part of the first letter to Timothy. And it's just a small phrase. Paul writes, I say this and this, according to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. Okay. According to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. This is in Hungarian. A boldog is den solo evangelium la amelia Yeah, you can read it here. So, this is a small phrase, but I find it very interesting. So, Paul says, I am preaching the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. What does that mean? This is glory and blessed and gospel. This is religious language. This is like Gloria, Hosanna, Amen. So, I, I translate it for you, yeah? First of all, Paul says, the gospel that I'm preaching, the message, is a message about God. 
it's not a message about humans. It's the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. And now two qualifiers, two characteristics of God. First, he says, it's the glory of God. And second, the blessed God. I'll help you a little bit. Glory in the Greek doxa means something like radiant. This is not church language. Paul is not using church language. He's using normal language. So glory is something like you see the sun and you say, wow, this is bright. And Paul says, God is like this. God is glorious. God is beautiful. And then the second thing is the glory of the blessed God. What is blessed? Blessed is like holy or like a little bit below holy. Again, 1 Timothy doesn't use religious Greek. He uses normal Greek. And the normal Greek word is makarios. And makarios means happy. Happy, joyful. What the writer says here is, God is beautiful and God is joyful. And this is our message. And I'm a theologian and our charism is to come up with difficult words for simple things. All right? So, here is a difficult word, word for a simple thing. I call that theocentric. What is theocentric? Theocentric means God is in the center. Friends, we have to put God back in the center of our message. Because Paul says, my gospel is the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. Honestly, I, I go to church a lot. I heard many sermons in my life. But so many sermons are about human beings. They are about what you have to do, what you're not supposed to do, about who says what and who said what, and what we are for and what we are against. But the central part of the gospel actually is the, is the most central question in the life of every human being. And this is the question, who is God? Who is God? As church, do we speak about God? Or do we speak about all other topics? And if we speak about God, do we speak about Him like Paul, that he's joyful, that he's beautiful, that he's fascinating. The central truth of the gospel is not that you have to be a good person. This is not the gospel at all. The central part of the gospel is not go to church on Sundays and don't commit adultery. It's a good thing to not commit adultery and to go to Mass on Sunday, but this is not the main thing. It is a message about who God is. Therefore, I love the fact that here in the Eucharist Congress, we take a week to speak about Jesus, to put who Jesus is, to put the Eucharist in the center, because the Christian life centers around Him is centered around who God is. If you ask me why do our people pray day and night, we have around 50 full-time staff members. Why is it that they do it, what they do? The answer is they have understood that He is worthy, that He is worthy to be loved, to be praised, 
So we take a lot of time on our conferences and our meetings to speak about Jesus, to speak about God, to put Him first. It is more important that you know Him, that you love Him, than all the things that you have to do. He's really good. He's really loving. He really wants to get to know you. Second point. Third point. We need rooms. We need places where people can encounter this God. Rooms. Something like that conference that I showed you. People need places where we can say, come and see, right? There are so many books written. But we need rooms where you can encounter fascination, where you can encounter Jesus. I show you some pictures. This is a skincare shop, a skincare shop in Germany. It's skincare. You can you can buy creams and shampoos and stuff. So, look at this. Look at this shop first. Would you want to go there? I personally, I would say yes, it looks nice, it looks welcoming, it's beautifully decorated. You know what I find interesting? It's full of religious symbolism. It's called rituals. I mean, this is a very Catholic word, rituale romanum, rituals. And then you have somebody with praying hands, you know, she's, she's, she's doing it like this, right? And then, of course, you have, you have other symbols like the, the statue. It's not Christian, right? It's more Asian or, or Buddhist. But it's, it's full of religious symbolism. And you know, what drives me a little bit crazy is our Christian churches and our Christian meetings oftentimes don't look so warm and so friendly as this shop. Or think about this party. This is a party somewhere in Germany, young people. If you see that, you would say, wow, they are having fun. They, they are joyful and it's a party, it's a celebration. Why is it? So many of our church and Christian gatherings, they're like sober, a little bit boring, not so beautiful, not so welcoming. By the way, I'm not saying that here because all the stuff, all the volunteers, you're doing an amazing job. You're so friendly. This is... But if we are fascinated by Jesus, our meetings, our seminars, our conferences, our church services have to look like Jesus. And this is being welcoming. Have, have an open heart. Make it easy for people who are outsiders to come. I love the fact that a good percentage of the people who come to our conference are people who are not yet Christians. I love it. These are the most important people. We have to build rooms that make it easy for people who are not part of the family to become part of the family because this is what Jesus did all the time. He celebrated parties 
with unbelievers. This is what Jesus did. So we have to create rooms and organizations and places and gatherings that make it easy for people who don't believe to experience fascination. If this is true, if God is beautiful, if Jesus is fascinating, and if us humans, we have a desire for fascination, the fourth point <laughs> has something to do with beauty. And for this, I have to tell you a funny story which is actually not funny, but it's very sad. But it's a good story. A friend of mine used to be a barkeeper. He was not Christian. He was working at a very exclusive, very expansive bar at the beach. And all the rich and famous people, they went there, they drank champagne, snorted cocaine, and did things what rich and famous people do. And my friend was in the middle of that, yeah, having party and drinking all the years. And eventually he hit a, a, a life crisis, his life broke down, and he started to question. He started to look around. And he actually became Christian. He became Catholic. He converted. And then he left his former job, his career, and he was looking around. He asked himself maybe, is he called to be a priest? Or he had different things. And he went to different seminars and, and monasteries and retreats and gatherings and all of that. And after two years, we met. And he asked me a question to this day, <sighs> hurts me. He said, Johannes, you Christians, you talk about beauty. How wonderful God is, and how the creation is, and about love, and grace, and Gloria, and Hosanna. But he said, Johannes, I ask you a question. For two years now, I go to all the Christian houses and retreat centers and meetings. All my friends from my former life, they have their restaurants, they have their bars and their hotels. Their life is meaningless. They drink champagne and snort cocaine. But when they open a restaurant, it's beautiful. If they open a bar, it's highest quality. If they open a hotel, the personnel is super friendly, everybody is welcoming, and it's, everything is done with love for detail. A little bit like this. And he said, Johannes, you Christians speak about beauty and speak about God, but then I come to your retreat houses. The food is not good. The floor is dark blue plastic. And the wall is gray. And it all looks like it was built in 1951. And then the personnel is not even friendly. And then it's not even particularly cheap. So what's wrong with you? I don't have an answer for that question, but I travel a lot in Christian retreat houses, and it's true. Something's wrong. And it's interesting. It's not just with us Christians, you know? <laughs> but in Germany, 
there was a ranking done. A ranking, what is the most ugly, the ugliest university? The ugliest. You want to see the ugliest German university? That's the ugliest German university. You know what strikes me the most? I show you a picture how universities looked like in the Middle Ages. In the 14th century, universities looked like this. Or looked like this. I believe that as a society, we have lost beauty. And oftentimes, as a church, too. Everything needs to be cheap. Everything needs to be simple. Everything needs to be just minimum. What have we lost? I can tell you what we've lost. Fascination. Because if you're fascinated, if you are in love with a girl, you don't buy the cheap flower for eight for int. You buy the beautiful bunch of flowers. Right? Love wants to give. And love creates beautiful things. This is why God created everything beautiful, because He's love. And I don't believe in a love that doesn't show itself. If we truly love Jesus, we have to take beauty seriously. We need beauty back. We need beautiful music. We need beautiful architecture. And don't, don't tell me, don't tell me, Johannes, but this is all so expensive. No, it's not always so expensive. Beauty is not always a matter of money, but it is always a matter of love. And the ugly thing is not always the cheapest. The ugly thing is just nobody cared. You know, whatever. You know? I tell you a very sad thing, but it's true. When we do our conference, so this is... Again, I'm not bragging about that. I don't care. It's... It's not to think, oh, look, what a great conference. This is nonsense. But there's a deeper meaning behind that. Yeah? Love wants to express itself. If we do this conference, I hire non-Christians to do the lighting, the sound, and the design. I do it with non-Christians. You know why? Because they do a better job. Because the Christians say, ah, this is for the church, okay. Ah, it's for the church. You know what? I do it for free, but it will be low quality. And I say, no, thank you. It is for God. Therefore, it is supposed to be beautiful. And then you have the non-Christians who do this. And I say, what? You do all of this for, for, for God? And then we have the guy behind the production, the FOH, you know, this production panel or somewhere backstage doing his tech thing during our conference, and suddenly you see him sitting there crying. He cries, he cries. And he says, I... It's a true story. He said, suddenly I understand. Somebody asked him, what do you suddenly understand? He said, suddenly I understand why Jesus died for us. This is a non-Christian light technician. And he sees this beauty and he is touched by beauty. I tell you something. This generation, especially in the West, is not interested in truth so much. It's not interested in morals. But they are very, very sensitive to beauty. And I'm not speaking about the outward beauty. It's not, oh, we're all going to have makeup and all have funny jackets, you know. <laughs> I'm
I'm talking about something else. They check you and they feel if this is authentic or not. If there is a deeper beauty, if, this, if the outward appearance matches the inner reality, and if they see that it is authentic, they will want more, because the human heart has a desire for God, has a desire for Jesus, and Jesus really is the answer. So we have to take beauty seriously. The fifth and the last point. I showed you big pictures about conferences and many people, but all of this comes from here. This is not a big conference, this is just a prayer room. And sometimes it's only one person, sometimes only two, sometimes only three. But it is all born from prayer. And this is where everything starts. This now is a famous Bible verse, but one we forget. I, I, for, I Johannes Hartl, I forget it too often. I need to repent. I need to come back to that over and over. Jesus speaks about fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is the multiplication of life. Fruitfulness is not many people in a conference. Many people in a conference can be here today and gone tomorrow. This is not what I'm speaking about. Fruitfulness is procreation, the giving of life, and life again, and life again. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I am him bears much fruit. Hmm. First of all, I love the fact it says much fruit. So, the Father wants us to bear much fruit. Much. I say that because there are some Christians who believe I just do my job in faithfulness day to day and I want to stay hidden. Yeah, but the Father wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to bear much fruit. But then, because apart from me, you can accomplish nothing. This last word is very fascinating in Greek, because if you read the original Greek, and for this word nothing, there is a Greek word that means nothing. It's very interesting. So, Jesus says, if you don't stay closely connected to me, all activity that you do may look great, but will not produce fruit. I have it in Hungarian too. So, abiding in Jesus is impossible without putting prayer first. Prayer first. Prayer is not the only secret in the Christian life, but it's the one fought against most. Prayer is not everything, but everything is nothing without prayer. And I don't care how exactly is it that you pray. Find your own rhythm. Find your own pattern. 
Find your own style. Find your own love language with God. But only if we set prayer first, we will see fruitfulness. I showed you great pictures about big conferences, but we didn't start there. I will, know, I will now show you the room where we started. Our first prayer sessions, our first prayer room is this. This is where it started. One person, two persons, four hours every day for many, many years. We like the big stories, we like the success stories, but all fruitfulness in the kingdom of God flows from the inside out, from the inside out. Our world is busy with the outside. And honestly, I love the outside too because I want to reach people. Right? I want the world to be reached. But fruitfulness starts from the place of intimacy with Jesus. Starts from the place of prayer. Dear friends, I believe this is a special time for the Catholic Church. It's not an easy time, especially not for us in Europe or in Germany. But every crisis of the church always has brought about a separation, has brought about a crisis. In the Greek, crisis means discernment. Some things will die and other things will be born. And sometimes old things have to die so that new things can be born. I believe that something new is born if we start to rediscover the fascination of knowing Jesus. Maybe you personally, maybe you realize my religious life is filled with things and things and things. Yes, but do you know Jesus? Do you love Him? Is your heart still burning for Him? And if not, come back. This is the most important question. See, I'm married. If I, if I ask my wife, all right, how often do I have to kiss you today? It's a strange question to ask, right? If I don't want her to kiss her. I have to ask the question, where is my heart? Do I love her? And if not, what has come between us? It's the same with Jesus. The question is not, how much do I have to pray? How often do I have to go to communion? Or whatever? It's not the question. The question is, where is your heart? And if your heart is not burning for Jesus anymore, which is normal because we lose our fire. Don't condemn yourself. It's normal from time to time to lose your fire. I have lost my fire many times. But you don't have to stay there. You come back. You come back to the first love. And if we start, even as a church, to come back to the first love, to put God back in the center and not us, our ideas and what we have to do and all our but God, who He is. Fruitfulness will eventually come again. But it's a way to go. It's, it's, sometimes, it's funny, after a Mass, after a service, I hear Christians, I hear Catholics talk to each other. Well, 
the organ player today, he was not so good, right? And the sermon, I didn't like the sermon, huh? But the choir, the choir was good. Yeah, the choir was very good. Well, the choir was good, yeah. And the flowers, oh, the flowers, they were very beautiful on the altar. Yeah, but this new song, I didn't like this new song. <sighs> and we only speak about ourselves. What we like, what our expectations are. Okay? I wish for some Catholics to gather around after Mass and ask, ask them a question. Do you believe God liked today's service? Do you believe that He felt welcome? Do you believe that He felt loved? This is the main question. You know? And if somebody goes to the organ player and says, this new song, I didn't like this new song. You know what the organ player should answer? Oh, you didn't like the new song. No problem. We weren't singing it to you. There is something beautiful in the way we worship Jesus that is lost if we, if we focus on ourselves, if we focus around what we want. You know. It's like kissing. If you kiss, you don't think about your mouth. <laughs> you forget yourself. You love the other person. If you're in a concert, you're not sitting in a concert and thinking about your stomach. Oh, how is my stomach feeling? How is my eye feeling? This is nonsense. You are paranoid if you do that. If you are sitting in a concert, you think about the music. You are all ear. <laughs> wow. This is worship. This is what worship does. Worship is you get lost. This is what adoration is. You get lost in wonder. And if we create rooms where people can experience that, if we fill those rooms with beauty, with music, and not just with superficial beauty, but with a heartfelt, authentic, warm, welcoming atmosphere, and if we prioritize prayer in our life, especially if you are active in the church, fruitfulness will come. One last remark for those among you who are active in the church. Who is active in the church, being in, in any ministry at all? Who is active in the church? Okay. As a volunteer, as a lay person, as a priest, as a religious whatever. One last remark. The service for, of the, for the Lord can become your Lord. Serving God can become your God. And that's a danger. God is more important than the service. You need time for God alone. Otherwise, your service will be become your master and your Lord and your God. But your service, your ministry is not your God. You were created by a loving, beautiful God for a beautiful love relationship with this God. And if you live this, and if you testify this, there will be a fascination that will speak about His beauty. And people will come and see, and the church that lives like that will be attractive. Even for Germans <laughs> or other nations. 
I would, I would like to end with a short prayer. So maybe may I suggest that we stand up? If you want to know more about the things that I do, you find a lot on the internet, on social media, and on YouTube and books and stuff. That's very easy. Um, let's just maybe close our eyes. And just for a moment, focus on, focus on Jesus. You don't have to picture him like a person, but just open your perception, your heart, for his presence. He's already there. He's waiting for you. And if there is one thing that struck you this afternoon, make it a prayer. Maybe it struck you that maybe you have lost your first love. Or it struck you that he is beautiful. Or it struck you that all fruitfulness comes from prayer. Make this your prayer and say to him, Lord, I'm coming back. Lord, I'm coming back to the place of first love. Lord, teach me anew how to pray. Just use your own words. Just be honest. You don't have to follow a formula. You can be yourself. Holy Spirit, I invite you to now fill this, fill this room and touch our hearts with fresh love for Jesus. Draw us deeper into community with him. Make us fruitful and renew your church so that the world will say, come and see, and will be fascinated for Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Kedves vendégeink, azt hiszem, hogy egy igazán lélekemelő előadásnak lehetünk szem és fültanúi. És hát azt hiszem, hogy mindannyiunk nevében mondhatom, hogy egy igazán tartalmas napon vagyunk túl. Reméljük, hogy mindenki jól érezte magát, és hogy épült lélekben, hiszen ez a kongresszus egyik nagyon fontos feladata. És bízunk benne, hogy holnap is találkozunk. Mielőtt elköszönnénk, szeretnénk átadni néhány fontos információt a holnapi nappal kapcsolatban. Így van. Holnap is közös reggeli imával kezdjük a napot, majd katekézis és tanúságtétel lesz. Érdemes időben érkezni és meghallgatni mind, mert a holnapi napon is rendkívül érdekes és izgalmas témákkal érkeznek előadóink, köztük Stanislav Gadecki, Charles Mangbo, Moises Acevedo és még sokan mások. 
Tomorrow, we will start the day with morning prayer together, followed by catechesis and testimony. It is worth arriving early and attending the morning program, because tomorrow we will have some very interesting and exciting speakers, including Stanislav Gadecki, Charles Mongbo, Moises Asafedo and many others. Fontos változás azonban, hogy szerdán nincs Szent Mise a Hung Expo-n, ugyanis a délután kora este folyamán különböző plébániai szentmisékre várjuk Önöket szeretettel, melyeknek nemzetiségeiről és a Szent Mise nyelvéről honlapunkon, illetve a programfüzetből tájékozódhatnak. Egy kis ismétlő technikai információ, hogy a zarándok csomagokban kapott rádiókat kérjük, hogy hozzák magukkal azokon a napokon, amikor részt vesznek a kongresszuson. Ezeket nem álmódunkban pótolni, hogyha otthon felejtik. Köszönjük szépen! Holnap 8 óra 45 perckor folytatjuk a programot. A kivetítőn látják a szerdai nap teljes programját. Várjuk Önöket holnap is nagy szeretettel! An important change, however, is that there will be no Holy Mass at Hung Expo on Wednesday, but you will be welcome to attend various parish masses in the afternoon or early evening. You can find the information about the nationalities and the languages of the masses on our website and in the program booklet. Allow us to repeat an important technical information. Please bring the radios you have received in your pilgrim pack with you on the days you attend the Congress. We cannot replace them if you leave them at home. Thank you. We will continue tomorrow at 8.45 a.m. The full program for Wednesday will be seen on the projector behind us. We hope to see you tomorrow again. Most pedig nem maradt akkor másra, mint az elköszönés. Nagyon köszönjük, hogy ma velünk tartottak, és együtt ünnepelték velünk a mindenható Jóistent, az Eukarisztiát. Bízunk benne, hogy hazavisznek magukkal sok jó és szép emléket és tanítást, hogy tudtak töltekezni a közösség erejéből és a közös imából. Reméljük, találkozunk a következő napokban is, és továbbra is megköszönünk minden imát a kongresszusért, a résztvevőkért, a közreműködőkért, a szervezőkért és egyházunkért. Köszönjük megtisztelő figyelmüket, dicsértessék a Jézus Krisztus! All that remains for today is to say goodbye. Thank you for joining us today and celebrating with us the Almighty God, the Eucharist. We trust that you will take many good memories and lessons back home with you, that you have been able to draw on the strength of community and prayer. We hope to see you in the coming days, and we continue to thank you for all your prayers for the Congress, for the participants, contributors, organizers, and our church. Praise be to Jesus Christ. További szép délutánt kívánunk, jó beszélgetést és további jó töltekezést a viszontlátásra. Viszontlátásra.